how can you teach people in like years of clinical training, right? Whether it's in medical school or psychoanalytic training to talk about human relationships and having healthy human relationships without talking about sex. I don't understand that. Like it's I don't understand so these worse. couple therapists who see couples and like, you realize that sex is probably the issue. If not like the top issue, it's like top three. And how do you not know how to talk about it? And I have friends who are like, oh, we were in couples care for five years. I'm like, did you talk about sex? It didn't come up. So yeah, I know it can sound like it really does. And cool. that's, I try, like I do my on my show. It's reaching a lot of people, a lot of couples. It's helping individuals, but you where people are, first of all, it's a subject of sex. Like you said, people cringe. It's so, it's difficult like to walk that line because everyone wants to know about it. They certainly need more information about it because we're not trained or taught anywhere about things that are going wrong. Like, what, I've got this weird feeling in my vagina, or it's dry, or I'm not turned on, or arousal, and we don't have many places to go. Hey everyone, you're listening to episode 12 of Unscripted with Nell Daly, and I'm your host, Nell Daly, a psychotherapist, TV commentator, journalist, and mother. We're so grateful to have you back, and if you're new to the show, welcome, welcome. The voice you just heard was that of Emily Morse, our special guest on today's show. Today we're going to be talking about a few of my favorite topics, sex, intimacy, for any of those who watched my TED Talk, which was literally on intimacy and relationships, with our own bodies and the bodies of our romantic partners. As you'll hear in the interview, many therapists and doctors are not taught to talk openly about sex in graduate school or medical school. But here's the thing. It's one of the top five things people talk about in therapy. I realized rather quickly when I began my private practice in New York City that I better get comfortable talking about sex. And I mean sex, not just sexual preferences or ideas around gender identity. Our sex lives matter, deeply matter. Sexual wellness is a huge part of our overall health. In celebration of the emergence of spring in New York, when everyone is crawling out of their caves after a long, dark winter and the trees are starting to bloom again down Park Avenue, the trees I pass as I walk from Grand Central on my way to Fifth, I figured it was time to talk about physical intimacy. Now, I needed to figure out with my producers when doing this podcast how to marry an interview with, let's say, Elizabeth Lesser one week before and an explicit talk about sex the next. What does talking to a best-selling author and a great spiritual teacher have in common with sex advice? Well, my intention with Unscripted is to talk about the things that affect our spiritual, physical, and emotional health. Sex brings all three of those topics together. Sex itself is not only good for you, it's the glue that bonds us. It's one of the things that drives us, and for many of us, it continues to mystify us. When we talk about sex, we're talking about eros, which is sexual love. Eros is actually the Greek and Roman god of love. Much of our lives is built around eros. We pursue eros endlessly. Eros, as Elizabeth Lesser says in her book Broken Open, can be the thing that literally breaks us open. Eros is one of our greatest spiritual teachers in life. So, by default, because of the work I do with couples and patients, I've developed a bit of a domain expertise on sex and intimacy. But I still have so much to learn, which is why my team and I here at Point Zero Productions is bringing you Emily Morris. Many of you are familiar with her and her work already. Emily is a nationally renowned sex therapist, she's an author, and she's also a modern day media personality. She is a graduate of the University of Michigan and has earned her doctor, Doctorate of Human Sexuality from the Institute for the Advanced Study of Human Sexuality in San Francisco. More importantly to me, she is also one of the few female pioneers in the world of podcasts, and she's hosted a long-standing, highly successful show called Sex with Emily, which she launched in 2005. 
She has about 1.5 million followers on Facebook and runs an informative website called Sex with Emily, where you can find answers to so many of her questions you have but are too afraid to ask anyone. Emily has appeared as an expert on many television shows, including The Today Show, Dr. Drew, HLN, The Doctors, Bravo, Inside Edition, MSN, Playboy Radio, Cosmo Radio, and she has also been featured in countless publications, including The New York Times, The LA Times, Huff Po, Glamour, CNN, USA Today, Cosmo, Men's Health, and Women's Health. And that isn't the entire list. So this woman has had an incredible career in media. Today, Emily and I are going to touch on a number of topics that are important to our listeners. And one of particular note, Emily and I discuss communication with our partners. As a therapist, I believe this is what many of us struggle with the most when it comes to sex. We're afraid to tell our partners what's working and what isn't. We're afraid to voice our fantasies. We're afraid we'll be rejected. We are ultimately afraid of not being accepted and seen and loved. An ability to voice our own wants and needs with our partners is something we've all encountered at one stage or another. Yet this is a critical skill that anyone can master, and it's the hallmark of any healthy, prosperous sexual relationship. We ask for feedback in so many other areas of our lives. So why, then, is it so hard to give and get sexual feedback? This has to do with letting go of our ego in the bedroom. In today's episode, you'll hear Emily and I begin to hash this out for our listeners. Emily has been running her show for over a decade. We can't cover it all here on Unscripted, but don't worry. This won't be the only show we do on sex and intimacy and relationships. But I know the conversation I have with Emily is an absolutely gorgeous starting point. So without further ado, Emily Morris. And just remember, these are adults having adult conversations. These are not for little ears. understand even how their body's working and why things are happening and what turns them on and pleasure and if you start with like sex education we're not told anything we're taught about we're taught you know about prevention and hpv prevention and, and stds and be safe and what's like the scare tactics but nothing about it is about pleasure and asking for what you want and learning how to communicate about sex and that sex is okay to talk about and and it, it makes sense that you'd have a lot of men talking to you about it because when i first started my podcast like 12 years ago I'd say the majority of my listeners were men. And I'm like, well, is it because men are like early adopters of new technology and they're the ones who see the podcast more? And now it's more even just because I think everyone's, but but men truly have nowhere to go. Like they're the ones who are definitely calling more because at least with women, we can talk to our friends. We right? talk like, to each other about it. Right. Yeah. Men, nobody. They're not what? talking to doctors. I'm like, you have not talked to your doctor about your penis. Thing. Come on, guys, go to the doctor. They're not talking to their guy friends. They're like, I'm going to go. So last night, I, you know, my penis prematurely erupted. What do I do about this? <laughs> I couldn't get an erection. Strange. Pass the beer. They're just, they're just that way. And so it would make sense that they would come to you or if they're doctors, if they're comfortable. And women, at least we have a little bit of a leg up because we've got each other. Yeah. And we're like, I guess I can talk to my friends about it. But men are like, there's there's nobody. They're like in this bubble. Like, well, so. and women, I think there's such a disconnect between women don't realize how the male brain works. Right. And so, they are having sex all the time. Yeah, like men, men are like, they're different beings. Like they think about sex all the time. And like women just don't, they're trying to like communicate about other things. And it's like, if your shirt's off, they, they literally like cannot communicate about that. Like exactly, their, their brain is reptilian. It has now gone reptilian. I've been doing this for 12 years as a podcast. I have my doctorate in human sexuality and I am just, I mean, it's never ending. My podcast, the numbers, they grow every month. I think more people are listening to podcasts, but they also, they grow. And the, I get hundreds of questions a day in my inbox, you know, and I've been doing, I mean, I do like two podcasts a week and I, answer emails we now we're taking calls and it's so true like just the questions and I want to say sometimes I have five questions too I'm like okay it's either a penis 
challenge, like a penis problem. It's an orgasm issue with the women. It's how do I get my partner to blank or how can I, you know, ask, how can I get my partner to do something that I want to try in bed? Um, and then it's like usually about something around communication. And then there's like mismatched libidos. Like we don't want to have sex at the same time. What do we, what do we do? But like everything kind of falls into that. Like there's like orgasms, there's penises, there's how do I talk to my partner? I'm like, how do I do this or that? And it's like, but then there's a million different questions, but that's what they all look like. Cause I think the main thing is that we don't know how to communicate about sex. Like we are, because the problem we get into relationships, I mean, I've got, I could talk to you. I already can tell there's like a million different things I want to talk about, but we get into relationships when everything is great, right? Like the honeymoon phase is like a biological construct that's from six months to two years. You know, your dopamine, your serotonin, you're connecting, you're attaching. All the sex is amazing in the beginning. And it's just, it's not going to be after two years. If you're lucky, 18, you know, year and a half to two years. And then it takes a nosedive and people are like, oh, we'll get back to that. But now we're going to focus on kids or home or our work, or our health or spirituality. But there's nothing in our society or nothing that people have never understand that your sex life needs to be prioritized just as much as your health, your spiritual life, your fitness. Because when you don't have your sex life together and you're not working on it and it's changed a little and you don't know what to do about it, then your your relationship is going to fall apart because that's the glue in many ways. Like if, like not that it's everything, but if you're not having great sex or at least connecting sexually, your roommates, your your friends, but you're not... You know, and sex is fun and it can be really amazing when you talk to someone, you learn what you both like and how to turn each other on and, or if there's a problem that is okay to talk to them about it, but we just don't even have the tools to start. And a lot of the questions I get are like, how do I ask this or what, you know, or am I normal is another one. Like, is it okay that I masturbate three times a day? But, but really it's just, I think it starts with that. Like they have nowhere to go with it. They don't even, it's terrifying to talk about because of all the shame and all the guilt and all the messaging we get around sex growing up. So it's, you know what I'm saying? There's just no entryway. It's like, I just, this is one of these problems that I'm just going to push away because I don't know what to do. So I'm trying to make it sex easier to talk about, more comfortable and give a lot of tips. I know a ton about sex toys and lube, but you know. Well, yeah, but you know, what I think is so beautiful about your podcast and I've been listening to it like crack, right? Like I'm like making dinner and like my kids run into the room and I have to like keep it a little quieter. (laughs) Even though I talk to my kids really openly about their bodies and human sexuality from a very early age because I just think it's too weird not to doing what I do. Like it's, and there's just no need. Like there's just no need. We just have to break out of that mold. But you give such credibility to the subject matter. And then you're also able to delicately blend in some of like the harder core stuff. And I think too many, I think too many of us as professionals in the field and just people in general just completely shy away from the topic. And and I think women do because we're afraid that people are gonna look at us like we're some sort of like sexual predators or whores or you know what I mean? Like, as a, especially if you're like a somewhat attractive woman and you're talking about sex, again, like you just end up triggering people anyway. And I have to let go of all of that. And you are such a warrior because clearly you went through that and just broke through it. And it was like, okay, this is what I do for a living. I'm going to talk about all of these things and just get yeah. into the work. Yeah, it's true. I was just like, I know that I didn't have a lot. When I started, I was a documentary filmmaker before. It was more like, this is something that fascinates me, sex and relationships. So I'm just going to start interviewing people and I invited him over to my living, my living room. I set up a microphone like 12 years ago and it was like gay, married, straight, divorced. Single. And I just interviewed him like, how do you great sex? Tell me about your relationship, you know? And then I was just like, just became like, and the show became popular. And I, then I went back to school, got my doctor, read every book on the planet about it. But I realized that it is like, and I guess starting out, I didn't realize it was just, I was fat. I was an art, I'm an art, fascinated, passion artist. Wasn't thinking like, what's it going to mean 12 years from now when your first name is literally sex and you're dating, you're out there and people like sex with Emily. But I do think it's changed a lot in the sense that people really are a little bit more open to it. You know, the fact that, you know, wherever like pop culture, you see more, so even on television shows, there's things you're like, wow, she's pegging him, you know, pegging when men right, like to be, or, you know, the, the fact that Walgreens is selling vibrators and everything is all about sexual wellness now. Like, you know, you go into all these stores. So I do, I feel like it's, it's always going to be taboo. It's the most taboo subject on the planet, but I feel like we're a little bit more open. Now. I, that's what I, think. I love but, that. And at some point in the interview, I love sexual wellness. Like, ooh, I just, that sounds so great. Um, sexual wellness. And I'd love to connect it back to at some point, just about spirituality and sex, because I think like that gets lost in the conversation too, but it's at the heart of every conversation, 
right? Like it, it's about like mostly what I talk to my patients about is that human connectedness that we feel through the sexual experience that we're all craving and longing for. So you're great because you're like a technical expert as well on like how to do certain things or how to crack open conversations. But at the heart of all of this is souls really wanting to experience how closely we can bond with each other and merge in a very spiritual sense sexually. Right. And exactly. I think men I think men feel that too. I mean, I think women on some level are like especially between the ages of 38 and 45 when they have a rise in testosterone can separate sex and relationships almost better than men. The men I've polled or the men who've spoken to me after the Larry podcast are all about like I still want to keep having sex with my wife. Like I don't want to go out and sleep around. And as a as a divorced woman now, the men absolutely want monogamy. And I'm looking and like, wait, you've had sex with the same woman for like 10 years. Like, don't you want to like do that again? They're like, I did that in college. Like, I'm over that. I really want to find one partner and have like a really deep, sexually satisfying, spiritual relationship with them. Right. And they weren't able to maybe in their past relationship because they weren't ready or they had kids. It just got off track. Right. But now they realize that they want it. Yeah. I mean, it takes, I always say like, it's going to take some work, but it's like, it's, it's, it's a really healthy, beneficial work that it's like, it's, it's not like it's a go god. We gotta work on our sex life tonight. It's like no, maybe you guys sit down and you're like, you take a tantra class, or you learn how to breathe together. You know, there's just some little basic things you could do to connect on that level. You know, like breathe, practicing breath together, and even just realizing that you both want to connect on a spiritual level and finding out what that means to both of you. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you a question that I'm sure you've been asked five thousand times already. Okay, but I have to ask it. People ask me constantly, how do I increase intimacy with my partner? And I don't always think they mean necessarily sex, but I really think what they're saying is, what are the exact words I use to crack open the conversation about the fact that we're not having any sex or that the sex is not satisfying because right. or not connected? I am shocked every single month that I have couples come into my office and they're not having any sex and they haven't talked about it with each other in years. Right. Like yeah. I've had couples come in and they've got four kids and they've had sex like six times. Right. Exactly. And you're Just like, I don't, I, and I'm like, wait, and you never talk about it. And they're like, no, we never talk about it. Because they don't know. It. Yeah. They don't. It, it's so, it, they, because it brings so much that, you know, maybe she's feeling inadequate because she, you know, after four kids, she wasn't feeling, she didn't have a lot of information to understand that like her vagina is going to change. And she's doing her keg exercises, using a vaginal moisturizer, you know, I mean, just, or that what's normal, what's not normal around desire. I mean, it just, there's so much misinformation. So they, so themselves, the men are probably thinking like, she's not finding me attractive anymore. Who knows what it is? We all go in our heads and just bringing it up is scary because we're afraid of rejection. We're afraid of being judged. You know, maybe there's a fantasy that the partner wants to try and they're afraid their partner's going to judge them. So there's a lot of different reasons. I get why they're not talking about it, but Going back to your question about like, is there a script or even how to say to someone, okay, but you know, I think it's really just a lot of it is timing. Do you want to go for that? Like, how do people really crack open this conversation or do you want to know? And then I can tell you what they could do about intimacy. But I think it's, it's, so I think it's that, first of all, it's about timing and it's tone and it's, you don't want to have this conversation in the bedroom. Like you don't want to be like, oh, you know, my wife rolled over when I tried to have sex again, like, you know. And, and I'm going to say, why haven't we had sex in six months? Like, you don't want to blow it up in the bedroom. So it's the kind of conversation you want to have when you're relaxed, when you're eating breakfast, you know, maybe even you're on a road trip together. It's so great because you're not making eye contact, but you're still in the car together. So if it's hard for you to look at your partner and talk about sex, I recommend that. Or on a hike. On a hike. That's what I said on the show. I said, go on a hike with them. Cause you're exactly. Cause you're not looking at them and you can like start to try to have the conversation. Yeah. Like, you know, whatever, whatever's going to, whatever works. And then it's like tone too. It does not like, I've really been angry lately. We, we need to talk about something serious. It's really just like, Hey babe, I, God, it's so nice being here with you today. I love this. I haven't felt, you know, I haven't felt as connected lately. And I really love, you know, I love having sex with you and I love feeling connected to you. And I just lately I've been feeling, and I'm not sure why not as connected. And I'm feeling like our sex it's really important. And so what do you think we should, do you feel this at all? Let them, let them talk. Like, how have you been feeling about that lately? Cause I think it's important, you know, and have them answer. It's like, yeah, what, what, what could we do about it? Cause it's, it's, I'm feeling less connected. You know, it's no blame, no, like you did this and you did that. And you just like, listen, like you started like a, Hey, what, what could we do? Cause obviously it's important. And I feel like, yeah. So that's how you start it. Like a very, like, let's open it up and let's talk about it. You're right. right like, what are you talking about? 
I think it's great. We had sex two months ago, you know, and then you take it from there. You're like, well, yeah, it's been two months. And for me, I just feel like I would love to have sex you know, a lot more often. And who knows what could come up? It could be something from a lot of times, as you know, well, two months ago was the time that you stopped coming home from work on time and I made dinners and you never came. Who knows? There's a million different reasons why things compound. People stop having sex, but that's the general spirit of the conversation. But how couples can enhance intimacy is it's not really even about sex. When I, when I think of intimacy or when I talk about it with couples, it's like, what about just like holding hands again? What about setting the alarm 10 minutes earlier in the morning so you can just cuddle before you both get up for the day? Or if it's different times, it's just a few times a week, you try to you try to steal those moments together. So again, and it's so it's like waking up earlier, holding hands, kissing, making out. Maybe you take sex off the table. If you find that there's been some problems with sex, you're like, let's just give each other massages and just start, you know, exploring each other's bodies again. I mean, there's so many amazing erogenous zones and things you could do together to connect. Because I think a lot of it is about just that the kissing, the hand holding, all those things that created the intimacy in the beginning, typically evaporate from long-term relationships. You're no longer holding hands. You're not kissing. You're not looking each other's in the eyes. You know, you're just thinking about the end product and that's the sex, the goal. And I, I don't like that sex is so loose, is so specifically defined as intercourse when sex kind of is everything. Sex can be, you know, of course it can be like oral sex, foreplay. It could just be out. Yeah, hugging, all that stuff. And um, I think that we really... What was I going to say that, that we lose the sense of that? Um, oh, I just lost a thought that I was going to say that. Yeah, no, we do lose that magic. And, oh, yeah. And the fact is, the other thing that's really misunderstood, which you probably hear probably from, uh, from people, is that is that they don't um, is that men and women do look at sex differently in so many ways, and there's no way really for us to understand for men and women to understand the difference, but unless we talk about it like we are now, for example, we were talking earlier about a man, like he sees his partner, he walks in and she looks amazing and maybe her nipples, he's at her breasts are showing or she's just looking sexy and he wants to grab her and start having sex. And she might be sitting there on her computer, finishing up an email and she's like, I didn't even see you walk in. You're grabbing me from behind. I am not aroused. I'm not turned on. So for women, just the arousal process between men and women are so different. So man sees you, his body responds, he's, you know, hard, turned on. And I'm thinking, the last thing on my mind, because when our brain gets on board with sex, like our body can follow, but I wasn't thinking erotic, that I wasn't turned on, I'm in work mode. I can't, our switch, right? Like men are, you know, frying pans. We're like slow cookers, right? Yeah. We need to- <laughs> so true. And- so it's such a misunderstanding that then, then, then our partner feels rejected because we're like, babe, I'm still working. Can you just go do your thing? And and I'm feeling guilty because I don't want to have sex, but I don't know why I don't want to have sex because I'm not turned on. So understanding that we all get, that we get aroused really differently. And so for couples to enhance intimacy, I would say just even the act of talking about sex. So once you get through that, like, let's work on it. Okay, great. I'm on board. It's like, okay, well, have you had any fantasies that you've wanted to try? Or let's do a sexual bucket list where I write down three things and you write down three things and we exchange the list. Obviously, it's things that you think, you know, you're part. It's okay to have fantasies in your head that you don't want to share, but there's some that you might want to. Um, you know, it could be simple like, I want to have sex with you on vacation. You know, I'm going to vacation where we're having sex under the, you know, under the stars like we did that time 10 years ago. Or it could be, you know, I want to watch porn together. I mean, whatever it is, you're just starting the dialogue. So you have these things that you're, exchanging you're like oh yeah that'd be fun and if that seems too daring for people it can just be you know maybe you're reading a ride together reading erotica or you're going to a sex toy store right you're going shopping like you're going to like babe land or some other great stores you have in new york and you're like let's look at some of the toys together let's look at this book about sex let's get some porn you know whatever it is you might need some outside stimulation to start the conversation like that might be interesting well that isn't interesting you know and just some more, um, some more like uh, context to kind of fuel the conversation, and then they get it going from there. You know what's so beautiful when you talk about sex? Just um, for the listeners out there, I'm on Skype with her, and I'm watching her. She talks about it. You have the ability to do what a lot of therapists can do well as well. You, but you have this ability to let go of the ego when you're talking about something. Like I can feel when you're even describing having that conversation, there's just like no ego involved. It's just like being naturally curious about your partner. And I think that that's so important to teach people is that 
you have to be able to let go of your ego in order to have uncomfortable conversations. And guess what? These conversations are uncomfortable, right? right? Like people are like, I want you to tell me how to have this conversation and it's going to feel really okay is what you're asking me, right? Yeah. Like, and it's like, no, dude, like if you haven't talked about sex with your wife in three years and you bring it up, it's going to be uncomfortable. But you have to get comfortable with the uncomfortable, like get your head in that place first and then just it's never going to it's never going to feel amazing to talk about it especially if it's like a very tender point in a relationship right. um or there there's a lot of resentment in the relationship and i think a lot of couples like right the sex breaks down because there's just way too much resentment flowing both ways and it builds up over time exactly there's all of that and it's true and i always think about like you're so right it's going to be uncomfortable like anything like anything that you're really great at or that you feel like where your strengths lie or things you really excel in, they, they probably took work. Like the first time you met with your financial planner or even talked to your spouse about money, oh. let's say. It probably was a great conversation, right? The money thing, like, what are we going to do? But then you got into a groove. You're like, okay, we figured out how much to spend. Maybe, hopefully, you learned how to talk about money. Or, you know, even going to the gym for the first time, right? You go to the gym, you're like, oh, I don't want to take this class. And then you go, and it becomes a thing. So with your partner, like, everything, and also all these areas that we excel in, like I'm saying, like money or finance or our jobs or our spirituality, it's ne nothing that is worth, nothing that you want to excel at comes easy, right? Nothing that you're really good at. And I think people expect sex to be the easy part of the relationship. Like it, if it's not easy anymore and it doesn't feel great like it did at the beginning, there's a problem. Well, the truth is it needs to be worked on just like every other part of your relationship. So yes, starting out might be a little uncomfortable. It might be like, I've never talked, you can even say, I know we've never talked about this. I'm not even sure how to do it, but I know that it's important for both of us. You know? And, and the more you talk, then it could become part of your dialogue. And actually, I think you might even start looking forward, looking, you know, start to look forward to it. You're like, wow, our sex is actually getting better or we're actually finally talking about it. And I'm learning all these new things and I can't wait to try these new things that we talked about. And I'm excited just to cuddle and take sex off the table. So I don't feel the pressure. I just want to like touch or give a massage like this is, and then it'll start building on each other. And you'll realize like, oh, we did this. It's never too late. You know, and I think that you bring up another great point there, and I heard this on your podcast repeated over and over again. Having great sex is hard work. Yep. Like, it's work. Like, it's like anything else that we have to do that we want to be great at. It takes some effort and some work. And I think in our culture, it's hard for us to slow down at all to do that work. Right. right? Any kind of, like, you know, stuff on ourselves, on our relationships is really, really difficult to find and carve out the space to actually work on that. And sex is no different. It's exactly. It's no, it's no different. And it's just, I can't, I, I can't emphasize it enough. I, I tell couples, like, you just, and individuals, because women have to understand their bodies as well. So when I talk about masturbation, so many women expect, and I don't know what your demographic, but because there's women of all ages who haven't quite figured out their own body. And oh. like, this is what I like. This is what I know. I need to move this way to have an orgasm during intercourse. And 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 so like understanding your body and for couples to understand as well that yes, it takes work, but it's like it's the most pleasurable work that, that you can do. And if you do it together, then you have a partner they're keeping you accountable, you know, to, to figure out what it is. But they're just I just oh, this is what I was gonna say is that I tell couples to to prioritize it like even when it's good at the beginning, like it's really good that's time to start talking about it. Like it's never too soon to be like, wow, that was amazing. Um, I saw you were on top and it looked like you had this great orgasm. Is there anything else? Like what else could we do together? And so it's like you, you start it early. Like don't wait until there's a problem. That's what mm -hmm. I'm saying. Don't wait until it's like, you're, it's like on fire. Like do it when it's on fire in a bad way, not on fire in a good way. Right. <laughs> not when it's on fire. But it, you know, you just, just start like, because when once, and I think it goes with women too, is that once you really understand your body, and that's why I talk so much about using lubricant and using toys because there's no shame in that. Women who use lube during masturbation and during sex were 80% more likely to orgasm, like according to a study from Indiana University. And, you know, Debbie Herbendack, like all the great researchers in the Kinsey Institute, basically. And, and we think, oh, well, lube, we'll use it if there's dry or discomfort, there's a problem. No, I use it every time. I have a few drops. Because our clitoris is not self-lubricating. It's not going to lubricate. I don't know. So sometimes you just add a little bit of drop, like a good lube. Like I love Joe Lube. I have a bunch of it on my website. Um, but there's a lot of, you know, don't buy stuff at the drugstore if you can help it. Or a lot of these cheap brands that you've heard of. And you just, so that kind of thing. And you're like, oh, really? Yeah. You know, that, that could really help you have an orgasm or enjoy sex more and get you turned on. Because your dry hands or using saliva, like that just, that doesn't work. And, and, and then toys, like little, like they're not, 
I think also there's a lot of stigma around using um, toys because people think it's going to, men might think it's going to replace them or she's going to want to, you know, cuddle up to this vibrator. It's like, vibrator doesn't cuddle. It doesn't take you to the farmer's market. You know, it's not going to do that. But what it will do is it'll provide a different experience. And maybe for a lot of women who can't orgasm during intercourse, which is the majority, right? So only 30% of women orgasm during intercourse. And of those 30%. This baffles, this, this statistic always baffles my male patients because yeah. they're like, no, I watch porn and they always come. Oh. And you're like, oh, right. No, they don't, A. No. And no. B, like, it's so many women fake it through like vaginal penetration with the partners that they're with from a very early age that right. men have got the message that they that she must be coming just from from penetration and no clitoral stimulation. Right. So that's exactly and, and you're right, your your uh, patients are you said like older even, right? Men in their 30s. No, we'll see, that's what, what's really interesting. I have a lot of those patients, but I also have a ton of women who are younger from 18 to the millennials, like all the way down to 18. I see a ton of those women. And the biggest issues I find with them is they've never had orgasms for a large part of them because, and it's not just because I'm in the therapeutic industry, so I'm seeing people who suffer with depression and anxiety. One out of every four women in their childbearing years now is on a psychiatric medication. And so because they're on these psychiatric meds, they don't orgasm. Right, or birth control too. Can and so pass. we just did a big, huge show with uh, Dr. Julie um, Holland who wrote Moody Bitches. And it was all about this double whammy effect of being on the birth control pill and antidepressants. And these girls are put on the pill, you know, at 16, like I was, because I right. got my period. And like, yeah, right. they, the doctor was just like, here's the pill. You, your cramps won't be as bad. And no talk about sexual health, right? And we were like, it was either we did that or we snuck to Planned Parenthood and like hoped that they would put us on the pill and we wouldn't tell our parents. Right. And so, but that's still happening. And I'm 41. Yeah. They're all on yeah. the pill. I know. It's so, it's so upsetting to me that it's still happening. I know. I get it. I, my niece, I have nieces, same thing. And I'm like, how is this still happening? So I'm really been passionate about like girls and sex right now because I just feel like that's where it starts is that that they don't even understand the concept of pleasure, that it's more about like, I'll give a guy a blowjob. I don't know what it's going to be, but I know he'll like me more or it's acceptable or I actually don't even care because I'm so disconnected from our body. So there's this big disconnect I think that women have from, you know, from from their own pleasure and knowing that they're responsible for their own pleasure and what makes them feel good. It's not that their partner's responsible for their orgasm. Like a lot of women believe someday my prince will come and so will I, you know, like there's going to God is going to ride up and, gonna know everything and then I'm gonna have this amazing orgasm it doesn't work that way and so that's why going back to the having intercourse or having an orgasm during intercourse the reason why they're not is there's a lot of reasons and just because women haven't first of all I want to say doesn't mean they can't because a lot of women just don't know how it's because they're not getting the clitoral stimulation if you're having sex it's a lot of times there's no way their penis, so when you're watching porn and she's being mind-blowing orgasm, I'm going, there is no way. His penis is nowhere near a clitoris. Like, that is not happening. Or it could be, you know, other things that are no, happening. No, and there's not- usually, like, you know, a penis up her butt, too. And so, like, you know she's probably not having an orgasm right now. But, uh, yeah, exactly. Like yeah. That, oh, God. <laughs> porn, Please don't learn anything about porn. I don't have a problem with you watching it, but don't. But you know what? A lot of the girls that I treat as well, and again, like I just don't think this is a special population because they're in treatment. They a lot of girls don't masturbate. No, they don't masturbate. They don't. Okay. They don't masturbate, and they don't. They don't teach us how to masturbate. No one talks to us about masturbation. The only oh. way we learn how to masturbate is like if we drink enough beers with our friends or wine coolers when we're right. seventeen, and say to our girlfriends, right. like, "Do you ever touch yourself?" Yeah, no, we don't know. I didn't, well, that, okay, so, well, wait, so let, I'm going to get to that one part, but the thing about toys is that for women, there's nothing wrong with using a little handheld, little little vibrator on your clitoris to get you warmed up or during intercourse, when you're on top or bottom, you will have an orgasm that way. Like, it, like you just will. So you're more likely to because you weren't getting enough stimulation otherwise. So there's nothing wrong with that at all. I just don't think there should be any shame to that. And men like vibrations as well, like on their shaft it feels great back to women it's true it's like i don't know if because during their alone time all these girls are just in their bedroom on their phone (laughs) or Uh. there's like i feel like i don't know why it's not occurring to them to masturbate maybe it's more anxiety or they're not feeling the desire or they really don't see it anywhere portrayed like for me i was 20 and i was having sex and i had been having sex for like three years and i was in college and my friends were like 
I'm like, sex is like, uh, like what's the big deal? Yeah. And they're like, having an orgasm? And I literally didn't even know what that was. And I went to a good school. I had family. You went to University I, of Michigan, right? Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> like a middle class family, the Jewish yeah. open, didn't know. I'm like, what do you mean? They're like, don't you masturbate? I'm like, what the hell is that? It didn't even occur to me. And now I'm talking to young girls, same age, 17, 18. They're like, ew, no, or I've heard about it because they don't even know what to do. So I think that I'm trying to educate women around like, when you're in your room, when you're listening to music, like set the atmosphere if you can, like whatever turns you on, your favorite songs, you know, take some lube, just start touching your body without the goal of orgasm, you know, like your nipples, like what makes you feel good and and I don't know, it's like that barrier to entry. Maybe once they start, they're like, oh, now I get it. It's amazing. But I don't know if it's because they don't know how or they think it's gross. They don't make time. They think some guy's going to figure it out for them. Or that PV sex, you know, penetration is just, that's where the most pleasure, you know, that's where all the magic is. I don't know. But women knowing their bodies, it will serve them throughout their lifetime for self-confidence, for sexual self sexual confidence. And you'll just have more orgasms. Like, you'll just learn what makes you feel good. You know, every one woman's body is different. Our G-spots are located in different spots. Our, our clitorises are located in different ways that there's nothing wrong with you if you can't orgasm with a partner. It just might be impossible because the way you don't figure out how to move it against your partner or maybe it's just too far up and it just will never work. And that's fine. Like, you're not deficient. But we can work around that. Let me just ask a quick question about the toys while we're on it for women. Um, do you ever think that there there's that, that sort of – I don't know if it's a wives' tale or not. That if you use toys too much, it gets it's like overstimulation of the clitoris, and then you yeah. can become desensitized. Like, is it all about the balance? It's, yeah, it's about balance. I mean, I've never honestly like um, if you use like the magic wand, for example, it's like one of the most popular sex toys of all time, and it's a powerful vibrator. Like I always say, like use it over your underwear, and you know, if when you're starting out, I mean, I guess if that's all you use, and you were like eh, really doing on a high thing. You could maybe, like, your body gets used to certain patterns, uh, but I don't think you're ever going to, like, burn out your clitoris or you're going to not be able to sexually function. And so for women who are worried about that, I would just say, you know what? Mix it up. Like, don't only rely on that vibrator or maybe you start by turning yourself on with your fingers and your hands and then you add it at the end or you use it to, to turn yourself on and then once you're aroused, you use your fingers. But, yeah, all that is an old way. I mean, I've been talk doing this for 12 years. I mean, I've never... I've never heard anyone say that that has happened to them and that they've never been like, I also have had people be like, I'm going to try to do it without. And they're fine. They're like, yeah, you're right. It's easy. It comes back. I can do it with my fingers again or my hands. So I think that is zero reason to not use toys because you're afraid you're going to become addicted to it because how are you using sex right now? Like, how's your sex life now? Like, what if this toy can give you? <laughs> right, right. Orgasms or 10 orgasms and they feel amazing and you can connect with your partner or use a toy like the Wee Vibe, the Wee Vibe Sync is a great couple's toy that you wear during intercourse and it you could actually she wear it it's like a C and she can it goes up against her G spot and her clitoris but it feels comfortable and his penis it's like you use it together or you use a little tiny bullet vibe in your hand, you know, you just it, why is that so wrong? You know what I'm saying? But yeah, I you know think what though, I think that wrong. conversation starts to bleed in for me a little bit about people who are just um, really closed off about their bodies. Right. Right. So then that conversation, like this is why talking about sex and sexual health or sexual wellness is so complicated also because it's like kind of redoing a house, right? If like you redo the kitchen, then your living room looks terrible. And then you have to start with the living room and then your living room, your dining room looks terrible. So it's like you start breaking open the, you start pulling the thread of sex and you start pulling the thread of like, well, she's not going to want to like strap on something and strap on something to him if she feels fat, right? Or she's just had a baby or she doesn't feel comfortable with her body. Um, or if you're with someone who is very inhibited, right? right. And so I think a lot of couples, I, I was listening to one of your shows, and I think a lot of couples start with saying like, okay, this is cool. Like the sex isn't that great. Maybe one of them right. is a little bit more inhibited than the other, but we have a lot of, we have a place to go with it, right? That's kind of exciting. Like I don't necessarily know if I want like a total tiger in the bedroom day one because then where would we go with it? But the problem is if like people are inhibited, when you meet them, they don't always break open, or it's harder to break them open. No, you're right, and because sexual growth is like a real thing. Like I don't, I don't think that we look at sex as a growing place. We think of it as like we have sex, check it off the list. Or someone's sexual, good at it, or someone's bad at it. It's very binary. Right, right exactly, and, and it's like sexual sex should be expansive. So yeah, and those. And you're right though, but there's many who are like you know what? I'm fine. I don't ever want to break out of this. It's I, I 
it's not interesting to me for whatever reason. It could be religious upbringing. It could be, you know, a lot. There's so many reasons why people have these feelings around sex. And you might never be able to convince your partner to convince your partner to open up. Like you just, you try, you talk about it. They're not open. Um, you can't make anyone do what they want to do. You can't make anyone get sober, like make them go to rehab, like unless they're ready. So that is true. But I think that if you just, I mean, I think also for some women and men, maybe the way they were, someone talked to them about it, just completely turned them off. Like, well, this last guy wanted to tie me up in, in a dungeon and that was crazy. And maybe she just wants me to talk to her. Like maybe she's like, I just want my partner to talk dirty to me and that would turn me on. So I feel like that, that maybe when, when people talk about like kinking things up or getting, you know, doing things in the bedroom, they don't even know what the options are. Like, okay, mm-hmm. you, yes, you could be like a wild tiger and be all strapped up or you could just like use a little lube tonight, you know, see how that goes. Or you could talk dirty to your partner or you could watch some porn together or read erotica in the bathtub together or maybe um, just wear a sexy lingerie and some heels into bed and that's a whole new thing. Like, you know what I mean? There's such a range of what people can do to make sex more, you know, expansive, I guess, and to grow that it's not – but people might just be shut down to the whole idea of it. And it kind of does go back to, it could be body image issues. It could be things that happened when they were younger. I mean, people who, I'm sure you see a lot of clients who, um, patients who suffer from trauma. Because untreated sexual trauma is devastating on so many levels that people who don't deal with trauma, they're like, oh no, I already, I remember it happened, but I'm done, I'm done, you haven't. Like you actually need therapy. You actually need to work all that out because it will wreak havoc on your sex life and your relationship for years to come. You know what's so important about what you're saying too is not only do they need the professional treatment, but I also really believe that, and this is, I don't know how this is going to go over saying this on the program. So I feel like one of the things that we touched upon was how we can start having uncomfortable conversations. And again, I just want to do a shout out to your podcast because one of the things you do really beautifully as a sex therapist is you give people actual real language. So for anyone listening out there, like you don't just say like, oh, you can talk dirty to your partner. You actually give them like examples, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Like you're so good. And I hear it naturally on this podcast. Like you're just really good at like giving concrete examples of what people can do. And that's a bit, there's a big difference between just saying what you need to do and actually giving people the language because it's all about the communication. And that's what you were saying before, that people don't know how to communicate around sex. So you literally give people like a, um, like a, like a Webster's guide of dictionary of like how to actually talk about it, like a language around it, which is really beautiful. One of the things before we end, I have to ask what happens because I get this question all the time. What, how do women who have faked it, how do those young girls who have pretended to have an orgasm for many, either many sexual times, like with one partner, many sexual experiences, or throughout a long marriage, how do you finally say to somebody, I haven't been having orgasms? Yeah, that's such a good question. Especially with the male, especially if you're in a heterosexual relationship, because I don't, we've had like a kind of heterosexual normative, you know, that that's, that's, what, we're norm- that's yeah. what we're talking about heterosexual sex but obviously we know that there's all kinds of sex out there between all different kinds of people um I show there's all sexual all grounds so um, right. but right now i know we're talking about heterosexual couples that is such a good question because um i think that i had a woman once who called my show she said not only am i faking one orgasm she's like, i'm faking multiple orgasms and i'm in trouble because i gotta do multiple fakes every time <laughs> I'm like, oh my god, that's exhausting. That's like Academy Award winning orgasm faking. This is like my, when I first started, like ten years ago. And she's like, and she's showing me how she did it. I'm like, that's pretty good. Okay, so here's the thing. I think what you do is you say to your partner, listen. I've been. I always tell people to blame me. I'm like, listen, tell me you were listening to a podcast or you read something or you something. And you're like, you know, what? I realize that like I I love. You know, having sex with you is amazing. And I just gotta, I gotta come clean with you that I, I'm really turned on. And I, sometimes I feel like I'm about to orgasm and I, and I'm not. And I have to be honest that there's a lot of times I probably said I orgasmed or you think I've orgasmed, but it's not the kind of orgasm that I really want to be having with you. And I oh, that's help. brilliant. Right. Like I'm getting there, but I don't think I'm getting like, I'm not jumping off the cliff every time. Exactly. And because I want- sometimes it just, just feels really good for a woman, but it can be very hard to climax. Where guys, it can be hard for guys to climax too, but generally it's harder for women, right? 
Right. And we're not faking it. That, yeah. So we're not faking to be deceptive. You know, let them know, like, I wasn't trying to hurt your feelings. It's truly, I think we do it because we just don't want them to feel bad. Like, we're such nurturers and caretakers. We're like, I know it's not going to happen for me. I, I really enjoy it. And women do enjoy sex if we don't have orgasms. We're not all about that. But I think it's more like, it's not going to happen. I don't want him to feel bummed. You know, it becomes just a, you know, a tricky kind of a messy situation. But I think if you just say like, let's do this together. I just got this new toy or I want to really learn how to have one with you. And so let's start out like dialing it back. And let's do foreplay again, where you're like going down anymore. I'm, we're doing some of these things together, reading these books together, doing things that are going to start to turn us both on so we can together rebuild this and I can start to have orgasms with you because that's all I want. You know, it'll be so fun. And you just kind of make it like a group effort. Emily, is there anything that has been on your mind lately that you haven't been asked? Like, is there anything like from, I mean, I, I look at you and I think what are, she's like found her dharma big time, but you've been talking about sex for over a decade now and you still talk about it with a level of exuberance. Like I looked at all of your shows. I'm like, how does she come up with this every single week? Like this woman can talk about sex all the time. And I even see your enthusiasm for the subject matter. And it's obviously like, it's obviously gone into there's political reasons why women like us want to talk about sex. It, it has to do with like gender and all the things that we've talked about and women's health and how really we, that's why we're here, right? We're really like trying to help people feel better and live better lives. And I can see that spirit in you when you're talking about it. But you still, you seem like you're still, like it's just as fresh as it was from day one for you, which is so brilliant. And I wanted to circle back to the spirituality behind uh, sex, right, for women which is I started doing kundalini yoga a year ago. Do you do kundalini? Yes, I was just going to mention that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, kundalini yoga really, for me, was like, gave, again, like a framework or a language around how powerful, women don't understand how powerful their sexual energy is. And we just did a show on the rise of the divine feminine and sort of the new masculine and what all this means. Uh, and I think if women understood when they started connecting to their sexual power, how that can translate into so many other places in their life, they would be amazed. Because when you're in that power, when you've activated that chakra, you can't, you, you become, you not only become more alluring, but you're a woman in her full agency. And there's nothing more beautiful than seeing a woman in her full agency, which can, which I think a lot of women are scared to step into because just as we started this show, it can be an act of transgression. Right, like you obviously stepped into your full agency to be able to do this work with confidence in a society that doesn't necessarily talk about sex comfortably 10 years ago. And you can see it, like you can hear it, you can feel the power behind it when you, just through your words, just through all the work that you're doing. And so I think that that's a really a beautiful point that needs to be discussed more and more for women. And it also helps them, as you know from doing Kundalini, tap into their intuition. Yes, it's so amazing. I know. I, I've just started doing it as well. And I, I've always know I've dabbled in it, but now I'm really going. And it's so true. So it's like I get a little nervous when I talk about this stuff. Not nervous, but I feel like people are like, oh, that woo-woo yoga. Or it's what do you mean by divine feminine energy or the feminine, you know, just – but it's so – I don't know. I just sometimes I think living in Northern California where I used to live for so long, it's like, oh, my God, people aren't going to get it. But there is just – if there's a great way just to say it, it's like you're going to learn to feel, like, sexy from the inside out, like the way you move in the world and the way you feel about yourself. Like your confidence goes up. You're, you're – just like the, we have such power as women, like this, this sexual energy, the sexual power, and it's just untapped. But it's there and it's available to every woman. Like we can tap into it. Whatever, and I think Kundalini is great. I think just breath and breathing in. Take a course, though. It helps. I think on our own, it can be really hard. So you're right. There are a lot of great things you could do. But once you get in touch with that whole flow and your energy, you're like, you will feel more turned on, more erotic, more sexual in like a way that feels empowering and not like I'm just putting on a sexy outfit and hope I get hit on. It's like your entire being is, is, is divine feminine energy. And maybe we have to convince women to do it through the back door. And what I mean by that is not like the back door, but... I, I mean, we all know women who weren't in healthy relationships where they weren't having a lot of sex or a lot of really good healthy sex, and then they get out of those relationships and they find a new partner and they absolutely physically blossom, yeah, right? right? 
and right. they've just their hair gets thicker, their skin gets clearer, their eyes are wide. They they've just like lost that puffiness. And I think that Julie Holland and I were talking about, and I don't know all the physical science behind why sex is so necessarily healthy for the body, like all the real technical reasons. I know it like lo lowers cortisol and all those kinds of good things. But you can actually just physically see it when women tap into their sexual power and they're in a healthy sexual relationship, how healthy it is. Like any animal on the planet who is being loved, what can happen? Right. So, so good. good. So, so good. Conversations. I know. Thank you. Emily, I can't thank you enough. Where can people find more of you? They can find me at, it's all at sexwithemily.com. And I podcast, I put out two podcasts a week. It's all on iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, Spotify. Um, sign up for my newsletter because we release all the podcasts and that. Also, I do all the social media. It's all at Sex with Emily, Snapchat, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Um, we publish also my website has tons of like really great you know articles amazing blog. articles they were great really helpful again like the helpful tips like really like and they're they're easy to read they're quick oh, yeah try. <laughs> we try For more information, go to www.sexwithemily.com. Again, this won't be our last podcast on sex for sure. It's too important, guys. So let's push through the uncomfortableness together and crack open conversations centered around sexual wellness. So please reach out with questions, no matter what the subject matter. Email us at nell at thedaily.com. And as always, come see us at www.thedaily.com. That's T H E D A L Y.com. Like us on Facebook at Nell Gibbon Daily and join our private face group, Daily Unscripted. Because we're going to be ramping that up. We're going to be ramping up the content of that private Facebook group this month to include very special access to me and to some of the guests that we have on the show. So till next time, everyone, peace out. May the light in me shine to the light in you. Namaste.